give me an example when the scientific method has been brought in when you think it shouldn't be with one vital caveat. Okay. The people who hold certain set or suite of propositions yep. believe them to be true. And I'm not talking about like- and Those are the people that apply. People who like, you know, use your example, like burgers, you know, the cheese on your burger people. Sure. Yeah. The existence of God? Okay. That's what I was thinking. So those claims don't even rise to the level of provisionally true. They rise to the level of like, well, I just feel that it's true. I mean, the, the, the those, I'm sorry, what, what are the, those so the, claims? The, claims, the, 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 the claims claim by the, the people who use the scientific method to say that God doesn't exist. No, they're not using the scientific method to say that, to claim that God doesn't exist. They're using, the scientific method is just a tool and there are people who claim that God exists and the scientific method would be the tool if you want to, because you're making an empirical objective claim about the world. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't the better posture be to say, I hope God exists. Mm -hmm. I think God exists. I don't know God exists. If I had proof that God exists, but the scientific method isn't to negate that. It's just to evaluate, well, scientifically, falsification, hypotheses, theory, etc. So I don't, I don't, Hmm. What am I missing? No, I, no, you're not missing. Ma. I don't think that you're missing anything. I would, I would go in two directions here. No, yeah. Number one would be, I would say that I, I do think that people say that God doesn't exist and that he is a figment or kind of a mythology or a figment of human imagination. And they think they can back that up with scientific data. So, so, so that, that's what I would say. Can, can, My, we, pa can we pause right there? Let's talk about it. the only person the only public intellectual I know who argues that is Victor Stenger. Okay. Everybody else adopts the definition that I used in my first book. There is insufficient evidence to warrant belief in a God or gods, but if I were given that evidence, I would believe. They just think there's just, like what? leprechauns, there's yeah, just yeah. not sufficient evidence. But, but, but it all, the crux is how you define evidence. And when, when you say evidence, you mean empirical evidence. And obviously there's none, or not none, sorry. Um, there is little. And it's complicated. Okay. It's very complicated physical evidence, but it exists. But you limit your evidence. So if you say, well, if somebody told me um, that they got cured of a sickness because they prayed to, to Jesus Christ, would that be evidence to you? No. Why not? So you exclude from the get-go what evidence can no, and cannot be. No, no, that's, that's yeah. absolutely not true. I, you know, I mentioned this in a conversation with Jonathan Prejou. Um, and people lost their minds, but you know, we, these are empirical claims that we, <laughs> you're laughing, it's true. These are empirical claims that we can test and indeed we have tested them. The largest N ever is the Harvard prayer study for intercessory prayer. That's an empirical claim about the world. That's exactly where you bring in the Socratic method, uh, the, the scientific method. Sorry, I got Socrates on the brain. <laughs> you should have a t-shirt of that. I've got Socrates <laughs> on the brain. I like that. It'd be a big set. It'd be a bestseller. <laughs> uh, Join me. Join me. Yeah, it, has to yeah, it just shows what happens when you're 50, which, uh, which changes on your brain from when you're 20. Anyway, um, so, but the claim that there's a God or a gods, the confidence that one would have in that claim, it, it ought not to be that high if it can't be tested somehow. Why? Well, how would it be adjudicated by independent observer? Why does it have to be? Well, then you get back to subjectivity. You just have your subjective truth. And you're not claiming it, but no, that, that you that, can't have fine, your but I'm cake not, I'm, and eat it too. You, sure, sure, sure. I'm sorry. But no, of course. But I'm not... I'm not what I'm saying is that you you are you by defining the method, yeah. you already define what the science can or cannot come up with. That's all. And what I see with atheists, and I mean I, I'm not gonna be able to make a like strong case here for the existence of God, no, I'm no, no. not prepared for that. No, but. no, that's not the conversation though, right? The conversation right. is are exactly. there some claims that's right. in so, which people can be confident in their truth without subjecting them to scientific verification. The <laughs> not everything in life can and should be scientifically verified. I completely agree. And then we should hold those claims with less confidence. 
well, why do we have to um, distinguish the confidence? This is already, you're already at a very sophisticated level of application, um, like of epistemological application. Like, does, okay, let me ask you that question. Does it make a difference to your life that you say, I hold a certain um, conviction with lesser certainty and another conviction with higher certainty? Absolutely. Beliefs aren't binary, right? Absolutely. I can think of numerous examples. That's why people get a second opinion when they go to the doctor. Like, we, we hold opinions with very varying degrees of confidence. And I think one of the problems of humanity, in fact, a baseline, if you look at it as like a homeostasis, a baseline problem is that we extend the confidence in our beliefs beyond the warrant of the evidence. Mm. And I think that is one of the greatest problems facing humanity. It's a perennial, perpetual problem, a time memorial problem. And the way to address that is through the application of the scientific method. Now, you can believe anything you want to believe. You, you can even believe empirical claims that are subjective to the scientific method, and maybe it's certainly true we've gotten things wrong, paradigm shifts again. Yeah. But the problem is that when people are more confident than they ought to be, and the only legitimate use of that confidence, I would argue, is through some kind of a testing process. Okay. If I'm missing something... No, 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 I don't know. think that you're missing something. Just, but... just remember Feynman's dictum, the easiest person to fool is yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, sure it didn't originate with Feynman, <laughs> but you, know, you have these the videos of these you know, people who think they're martial arts masters, right? So they have this view of reality in their own <laughs> head, and they're going around with, you know, like, like in the video game, like, Hoya Ryun. And you know, got, you know, basic MMA fight like blue belt just kicked the shit out of these guys, right. right? So that's an example of we need some kind of testability, and we need to proportion our beliefs commensurate to the evidence. Yes, good. The so, okay, yeah. There's so, a lot there. I know. No, no that's all right. The so I think okay. So the, the first thing that that I, and this is I think the most important thing is that. Um, That claim entails, your claim entails, a certain dogmatism. Really? Which is that everything has to be subjected to the scientific method and it has to be subjected to potential falsification in order for me to have a higher degree of certainty in that conviction. How on earth is that dogmatic? It's dogmatic because you, well, because <laughs> you make the content of what you are trying to be or to form an opinion on, subject to a method, and you say that everything else has to be subject to the same method. Well, and what other method would there be? There's other methods of other sciences. Theology is a science. Philosophy is a science. Th th theology isn't a science. Of course it's theology is a science. How is it a science? Is it subject to falsification? What is, what is science? Oh, that's, a, that's a great question. I, I look to, to Deutsch, and Dawkins has written about this. Maybe It's the application of the process of the scientific method to particular claims about the world. Okay, Sci science is an ordered uh, whole of knowledge or a systematic ordered knowledge. So that, that's what our Aristotle Theology is, by definition, here's another, if you wanna use a philosophical, there's no convergence upon theological matters. Whereas there's a convert, you can get like Japanese people, you can get midgets, you can get like obese people, people from like, you know, wherever, and, and you can study certain phenomena, the speed of light, how things fall in a vacuum, and there'd be a convergence on that. There's no convergence in theological matters. And therefore... Over 85 people in the world believe in God. Yeah, they believe in... Some people believe that you should not eat pork. Some people believe that Jesus was... That, that's was fine, but that's, a, that's a pretty strong convergence in a supernatural belief. No, no. As I, a religious phenomenon. No, 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 no. I mean, the sheer amount like when you get a little more granular on that jesus was either crucified or he's not muhammad was the last prophet or he's not they're extraordinarily subjective things and so those are theological claims and yeah that's what happens when you don't use the socratic method it's like the horse in alice in wonderland that you know the, the horse that rides off furiously in all directions you, you you don't you don't you have the opposite of convergence and so the I would argue to you that epistemic humility is warranted in those situations to dramatically decrease your confidence in the tr truth. They're not even provisional truth. They're just kind of sentiments or 
you, in, instead of even saying true, you can just say hopes. You know, I, I hope that Muhammad was the last prophet. I have no problem with that, like zero problem. I would say that epist epistemic or epistemolo not epistemic, epistemological, uh, you know, epistemic uh, humility comes from seeing reality and being open to receiving new information that I do not predefine from the get-go to be of a certain quality. Okay, so let's let's and that, see. And that would include just to make that addendum. Yeah, uh, that would include that I am not approaching reality with a given method. But that includes that I discover the method along with discovering reality, because the method will always have to account for phenomena that I cannot account for. And I give you a practical example of yeah. that, of a, an ideologue, and this word is also highly overused, so I'm almost be, be, begrudgingly using it. But yeah. an ideologue is not open for changing his mind because every phenomenon that he is, discovers has to fit in his ideology. If it doesn't fit, then the phenomenon is changed. Typical classic like Marxist understanding. Um, I would disagree. I, I would say when I encounter a phenomenon that does not fit into my methodology, I rework my methodology. Okay. Do you rework your methodology, like the scientific method, or are you reworking the claim? Well, both, I guess, right? Because the claim would be then like an effect of the method that I'm using. Okay. So the fact that you can use another method and different inquirers can come to different opinions should cause an independent person to question the validity of the instrument they're using. Yes. Okay. So if that's true, then the claims that people make about reality using another method are instantly suspect. Whereas the claims that people make about as a result of a scientific process of, you know, preparing and falsification, those claims are held as provisionally true and we can lend our confidence to those things more readily and more easily. And, and so I, I'm kind of like thinking about this idea of the dogmatism of the hegemony of the method, mm -hmm. right? So, <laughs> all right. Yeah, okay. Right. It's a convoluted, yeah. Yeah, it was a convoluted. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's fine. No, but it's, it's very complex. Yeah. Oh, complex. Okay. Um, so if the, if you want to make the claim that the scientific method is a kind of epistemological dogmatism, I don't think that's true. Like, like let, 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 let's say that, you know, you, you walked in here and you say, look, you know, I have to cut the interview short because I, I have this uh, crystal ball in my basement and uh, it's, way, it's way better than the scientific method. It's way, way better to, you know, for, like I've asked it, you know, I've made eight predictions so far about lottery stuff. It's been, it's been on 100% of the time. I wish, <laughs> I wish to. Like, give me some of that. Um, so, uh, but the way that we would evaluate your claim of the crystal ball would be through the scientific method. I, so there's a kind of convergence there that gives warranted confidence in our beliefs. Whereas theology or any other method, you know, I'm thinking Schleiermacher and Dilta, you know, hermeneutics for, you know, looking at biblical exegesis or ancient texts, those methods themselves are, you know, despite the maybe not the pretense of objectivity, but the hope of objectivity, that there is, I don't see how the scientific method could be a, do, a kind of dogmatism, provided that you're making the claim, hmm. right? You, I understand you're making to those, those truth claims. Just yes. don't claim the things to be true and there's no problem. Well, but you you constantly this is the this is just the classical stance of the of the academic skeptics, right? So those that inherited Plato's Academy, um, and the the method of Plato became the only principle that held them together, right? So yeah. the Socratic method, going back to that again, yeah, yeah. somebody's on my mind again. Yeah, that's no, um, good. Good thing to have on your mind. That's, We're gonna get right. him a shirt read. That's the next thing. Yeah, yeah. We should we should really do that. Um, so. So that's the, that's the last thing that, that remains of Plato and academic skepticism leads to, well, effectively very little. Why? Because a skeptic 
Um, a skeptic lives in a constant state of, as you say, as a, um, not hypothesis, but I'll use a different word, of um, like a preliminary answer, not a final answer, but what's the word that you used? Um, provisional? Uh, thank you. A provisional answer. But that's not how human life works. Because I'm not making decisions provisionally. I'm making decisions definitively. Right. And I'm talking about an ideal to which people should strive. Yeah, but then it's, that's fine. But then it's not real. If it's an ideal to what we strive, then we're faced with utopia. Oh, well, let me throw out something. And if you think that this is an unfair characterization of your position, let me know. You know, I'm thinking of Gadamer and I'm thinking of hermeneutics. Yeah. And I'm thinking of Caputo's um, critique in, in that all hermeneutics devolves into radical hermeneutics. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that the criticize, the, the, not even the criticism, that you're offering these alternative modalities to knowledge, but that would seem to me to be akin to looking at a knowledge landscape or a knowledge horizon that's proliferated by not even competing, not even competing instruments to truth, but a kind of radical harmony, like a kind of radical interpretation. So it seems to me that the position you're offering is not only subjective, but it, and I'm going to say the word devolves specifically, it devolves necessarily into a kind of relativism because the tools that you're using for analysis themselves are not operative, operating by the Socratic, by the, the science, there we go again, Socratic, to the scientific method and thus leads you to arbitrary conclusions to which you would inflate your confidence beyond the warrant of the evidence. That seems to me to be a necessary condition of what happens with the, all of those cr criticisms of scientism. If that's unfair, tell me. If you think I it's no, it's I, I never I, I was actually never accused to be a relativist. I was accused of being a lot of things, but not that. So that that's that's really, so thanks for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, because that's exactly what I'm trying to combat. Yeah, me too. But it would seem that your position entails it. Oh, I if it does, I don't I don't see it. But let me, maybe I can I can put it in a different way. Okay. Okay. So. And I, I hope this will clear it up and not make it more confusing, but okay. I think it will clear it up. Um, Chesterton has a very good commentary in his very short and very readable, as everything by Chesterton, um, mm -hmm. on, on Aquinas. And it's in the last chapter, I think. And he says, Aquinas had a very particular um, intellect because, which is specifically anti-skeptical, because what does the skeptic do? And this is not going to take long. What does the skeptic do? The skeptic says, look, we have some data. Um, we reach this data through our senses. Our senses are not always reliable. Correct. And that's why we need to question the data. And the ideal starting point would be to say, well, let's just assume all data is wrong. And then if we can work our way out of that pit then we definitely have something. Because if we start with saying everything is wrong that we know. Okay. I know so where you're that, going, yeah. So, so that's, that's, that's essentially the skeptic as illustrated in, as he explains, in St. Augustine. St. Augustine has a very interesting way of then actually reasoning to the existence from God from that, which he says, well, okay, I'm not going to get there. I'm not going to go to that. Okay. Aquinas said, okay, we are confronted with some data. Our senses may or may not deceive us sometimes. And so let's just assume that the data that we have is not all data there is, but it's just ex actually that, the data that we have. And these two positions seem to be very close, and maybe this, these are in fact our two positions, but I think they're actually, um, well, I think that one is actually more consistent and more fruitful for life. <laughs> it's and a nice way of saying wrong. The other one is wrong, but go ahead. <laughs> because um, the skeptic will never be able to dig himself out of the hole that he has created. Because once you stop trusting the senses or any kind of data, 
then you always ask about the condition of possibility of knowledge. Mm. Whereas the realist says, okay, the data that we have is not very much because the data potentially is like this much and we only right. have this much. Right. Okay. But we should not negate what we have, but rather work our way from what we have to maybe what we don't have yet. And that, I feel, is the, is the spirit. Let's go back to the medieval university. And this ideally is actually what I think is the best science. And, sorry, it, it's just something that burns on my, yeah, yeah. my fingernail. So, because you talk about the scientific method, most of the people, I think, out there have never applied the scientific method. And once they do, they will radically change their convictions. It is because they hear from people that have or have claimed to have used the scientific method to come to some kind of truth, okay, and take their opinion on authority. And that's where I'm most happy. Like, if somebody wants to disprove God, okay, and wants to do that by looking into empirical matter, then please do that, but do it in a lab, okay? Do it like Einstein and like Heisenberg, who always said at the end, we actually don't know, and what we actually thought would disprove God didn't disprove his existence at all. This is, I think this is Max Turkov, right, who says that um, in the glass of science, right, on the top is atheism, and when you drink it, on the bottom is theism. And that's what I think is effectively happening, is there are people who think that they apply the scientific method, but they do it claiming that they're not dogmatic in their application, and second, they're not actually applying it in a real-life setting. Whereas if you do talk to mathematicians, if you do talk to physicists about the atom, the consistency of the atom, what we understand by matter, etc., they, 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 I mean, that's what Einstein says, well, ultimately it's energy. And here comes Aquinas in the 13th century saying like, well, that's, that's what I said. Like the core of reality is actually the act of being, which is actuality, pure actuality. So how is that different? And how can we say that one is a great scientist and the other guy is some backwards, you know, medieval Dominican ideologue? And I just don't buy that. I think both of them actually got to the same truth, but from different perspectives, using different methods, clearly different methods, using different even devices. But in the truth that they discover, they converge. And so that's the convergence that you were asking for before, mm. I think. Um, and that, but Thomas did it with theological methods. And Einstein did it with physicists' methods. And there's mathematicians that do it on mathematical grounds. And, and so that's all I'm saying. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. This falls under the umbrella of my nonprofit, National Progress Alliance. Your generous donations keep us going and help fuel content like this. We truly appreciate your support. Thanks again, and we'll see you in the next one.